It's the top of the hour, so let's begin. Let me welcome everybody. Let me welcome you to this week's Future Trends Forum. My name is Brian Alexander. I'm the host and the creator and the cat herder of the Future Trends Forum, and I'm delighted to see you all here today. We have a great topic with a pair of excellent guests. I'm really looking forward to connecting all of you. Now, what I really like to do is introduce this week's guests. I'd like to begin uh, with Michael Cato. Michael is a Bowdoin College, so if you ever want to talk about winter, he knows exactly what that is. He's a senior vice president and chief information officer there, and he has been leading an extraordinary effort that combines hardware and network connectivity to bring remote students together. And I, I find this to be an absolutely fascinating project, and I'm just grateful that he has the time to join us right now. So let me bring him up on stage. Michael, hello. Good afternoon, Brian. It's great to see you. Well, I'm really glad to see you. Thank you for making the time for us, uh, and thank you for being here. Uh, and also, thank you for continuing a long Future Transform tradition that is, we're biased towards guests and beards. Oh. <laughs> well, I apparently have some work to do, so I'll get on it. Oh, yeah. It's good Please to see keep you. Going. Keep going. You have support here. Um, Michael, you know, I guess I have a whole series of questions to ask you, and, and, and I just want to lead up with one quick one, which is looking ahead for the rest of the academic year, you know, into spring 2021. What are the big topics and the big ideas and the biggest projects that are uppermost in your mind? You know, I appreciate the question. I think the way I would answer it is trying to learn as much as we can from the fall experiences so that we can iterate in ways that better support our faculty and our students for the spring, right? We are actually kicking off a formal assessment of the fall online learning app, learning and teaching efforts. Mm. Um, and we are doing it early because we would like to learn those lessons in time to make whatever changes we can to respond to the feedback that we get. Um, because we don't believe we've solved everything for the fall, and we think as our model flexes a bit for the spring, we're going to have more students on campus, as an example, and faculty will have um, more flexibility to choose to teach some classes on campus with some considerations that I'm happy to talk about as we go through this. Um, but that means that we can't be content with the model, with you know, thinking that the model that we have for the fall will serve us exactly the way um, that we will need it in the spring. So that's what's top of mind for me right now. Oh, I appreciate that. I appreciate that very much. Um, and that it's really impressive to do a formal assessment this early. Uh, that's very smart. That's very smart. I appreciate that. Um, now, before uh, before I bring up our, our other guest, I, I just want to ask you and see if I understand your project correctly. Um, what you've done uh, is you have managed to arrange to send uh, an iPad to every student um, at home, every undergraduate student at home. And in that iPad kit, you also have a couple of things. You have the uh, a stylus, although they don't call it a stylus, I think it's a pencil. Um, uh, you have a, a bunch of software, uh, and you also have a paid up um, cell phone network subscription so that if a burdened student does not have Wi Fi or Ethernet uh, capability at speed, they can nevertheless get online as long as they have cell phone access and join their classes. How am I doing so far? Pretty close. A couple things I would offer as, as modification. So first, yes, Apple doesn't call anything simply, so that's not a stylus. It's an Apple Pencil 2, uh -huh. and the keyboard's not just a keyboard. It's a magic keyboard. Every time I have to write magic keyboard, I pause and say, <laughs> yes, this is Apple. I have to call it what it actually is. Um, but the, it's a, and I'm happy to talk about why, that's, why we think that keyboard, the choice around that keyboard was one of the things that was also really helpful. Um, but the cellular internet is, was one of the big reasons we chose the iPad Pros, so specifically the model that we picked for students. Um, and so what we've done, we told students, if you have a cell phone account um, and your family's in a position that you can afford to enable it, just go ahead and enable it. We don't need to be involved at all. Mm. But if cost is an issue, that there's a, a simple form you fill out, let us know. And my team is actually, I'm really impressed with the work they've done. They're going to the level of confirming the address where the student will spend most of their time and then checking which provider has the best coverage in that area and then we'll activate the device for that area, for that carrier. And so then the college will be paying for the service that way. And as of this week, uh, just over 260 students have taken us up on it and we're paying for their coverage. But it's not that we've enabled them all before we sent them out. We wanted to make sure that for those students who can afford it, please go for it. Um, but for those who were cost to be an issue, just reach out to us and we'll be happy to enable it. 
260 students. What what portion is that of the uh, of the lot? We're 1,800 students, so it's just under one sixth of our student population. Thank you. And we, I have every expectation that that number will change somewhat as we bring more students to campus next semester and say our first years now go back home or we're working off campus because most of our first years have been on campus, so they haven't needed the service. So we do expect that there'll be some changes as we go from one semester to the other. Excellent, excellent. Uh, this is a fascinating, fascinating project. Um, and uh, friends, you will all have questions about this, I'm sure, um, everything from how did he manage to do this uh, to questions about software or is it really called the magic keyboard? Um, but in order to kick us off with that, I'd like to uh, bring up our other guest this week. Uh, and this is Jill Yoshikawa, uh, who is a founding partner at the Creative Marvels Consultancy. And she's coming to us from the West Coast. Is that right, Jill? I am in Sacramento, California. Fantastic, fantastic. I'm really grateful that you could come to us this morning. Thank morning. you for having me. Um, it's nice well, to meet everyone. Well, it's it's great to be with you. You're you're in a you're a great tweeter, um, and you use the hashtag very well. Um, and I'm I'm also just uh, grateful to connect with you, um, partly because I admire your consultancy, but also because I like the way you ask questions. Um, let me ask you one question, and then sure. I want to unleash your question asking capability. And that is for the same one that I just put to uh, Michael. Looking ahead to the next year, what are the big topics and the big projects that are uppermost in your mind? Well, that's a great question. For me, it's been about community. Um, I think that we have talked a lot in the press and I, I think universities have done a lot of work to really look at pedagogy and how you deliver content to students. But my concern, listening to the students that we, we know in colleges all over the United States is really they're missing that socialization. You know, one of my students is living in Santa Barbara, but attending classes at Berkeley. And so he's really extended. Some of my students are here in Sacramento. Some of my students have taken a year off. They're deferred and there's really not a connection to their to their university at the moment. So how how do we build that? Plus the, the loss of those informal spaces where students would just sort of walk out of class together and strike up a conversation or ask for clarification about something the professor said and then end up at coffee and have some existential conversation about the meaning of life or see their professor wandering across campus and just you know hail them down and have some conversation about the fall leaves or something like that. That's really been my concern. Also in the residence halls, um, when you don't have the interaction between first year students and older students, there's a loss of that kind of mentorship into college. Oh. So our students are really thinking about that loss of coming of age, of being on their own. Um, one of my second year students who's here in Sacramento, but um, attends school in San Diego, she called it, she said, it's like being a 30 year old and continuing to go to high school parties. Oh. Um, so that, that's really foremost on my mind is when we all get back together, are those bonds gonna just snap back into place or, or how are we gonna re remake those um, in the meantime? Well, that's, that's, a, that's really well phrased. Um, and uh, and that's a, it's a great problem to think about. Um, we have all kinds of, uh, of, 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 I have all kinds of questions for the two of you, but, um, but if, if I could, um, why don't you lead off, Joe? What, are, what kind of questions do you have for Michael about this iPad initiative? Well, that is, uh, going back to community is, um, I know that this is a primary tool for teaching and learning. How else has your staff um, the student affairs staff or other even um, faculty work to use this to build community because in many cases faculty are the public face of the university to the interfacing with students right now. So how is that continuing to happen and what kind of feedback have you heard from students and faculty about those new roles? Yeah, I think that's a really great question. And I appreciated that that was your top of the mind answer for next semester, because I realized that that's, that's very a close second or third for me, right? Community and burnout are the other two for me that have nothing to do with technology. The places I, I look to as examples of the work that's already happening is that our faculty and our students, frankly, among themselves, have been using many of the platforms to extend beyond the places they were initially intended. So it's not just about classes and in-class session. Right. We, as an example, we've been a Microsoft shop for a long time, so we've had Microsoft Teams available. But when we did the emergency switch in, in March, 
uh, a lot of faculty started asking for Zoom because they were hearing about it from other colleagues or they were you know, connecting to Zoom sessions at other, in other programs that they did extended more, more, more broadly. And instead of ending up in the, you know, the, well, we use Teams instead of Zoom, instead of having that argument, we decided to enable both platforms more broadly so that everyone has access to it. And I've been intrigued to watch the utilization numbers over the last few months because one, for the type of institution we are, we never really used them that extensively before. But now everyone's using them everywhere. And our Zoom utilization numbers, the number of sessions, are higher on the weekends than they are during the week. Oh. Which is really interesting for me to see, right? Yeah. Because it's, we are not teaching classes on Saturday and Sunday that often, right? So this is these aren't in-class mm -hmm. sessions. And the first time I had a student group reach out and say, we are an improv group and we would like to hold a Zoom webinar, would you be able to work with us? You know, my first response was, sure, we're happy to do it. My second is, I have no idea how this is going to go, you know, <laughs> but it went so well for them that the other group started raising their hand and saying the same thing. In addition to being able to use their own accounts to be able to connect with small mm -hmm. groups, they wanted to be able to use a much larger platform to allow them to engage. And a lot of that is really happening. And I think happening in a lot of ways well, but we're now seven, eight months in. Right. And I think that that transition, this is where to your point about community and my concern about burnout how we flex to be more creative is the challenge that we have now. And I, I tip my hat to my colleagues in student affairs and to the work that the faculty is doing, uh, the faculty are doing, excuse me, to try to help our students um, find these novel reaches, novel ways of reaching them. Um, because, the, the, you know, I think many of our teams were doing Zoom happy hours when this all started and it felt novel for the first couple of months, right? Um, we did, my team did a, a virtual cooking show with a chef, who, a friend of mine actually, who I hadn't seen in 20 years, mind you, but this is just kind of intriguing. Um, she's a, now a chef for America's Test Kitchen. And so she was willing to do a virtual cooking show for us. We picked the recipe, she guided us through, talked to us about her career, returned to this really great conversation around issues of diversity and inclusion because she's a woman, she happens to be a black woman. Um, so there's some ways that we're using the tools, but because you know our model, our teaching and learning model is not really built around distance it is much more about proximity it is much more about that intimate relationship between faculty and students um, we know that this is not the model that we want to maintain in in its in its entirety but there are things from this i suspect that we'll want to learn and carry forward sorry long way of answering your question but i, I hope i got a little bit to what you're asking about can i ask a follow-up question too so do you believe that um, because you had those existing relationships, just the culture of Bowden to begin with uh, was more intimate and seminar based and that kind of discussion oriented, that that helped in the transition? So then the the, the technology just became another tool where maybe uh, public universities that are larger and don't have as much of that, you know, ready made in their culture, for especially in a, a lower division classes, that that transition might be more difficult? Yeah, I think that's a great way of framing it. I suspect that there's some some of that has definitely happened. I think we've been served, especially for our returning students, for the students who would have been coming back to campus. And in fact, I should back up and be clear. Our fall model was that we invited all first years to come to campus. And um, a few uh, groups of other students were included as well. So if we had, if you had um, situations in your home environment that just it wasn't going to be conducive to you being successful academically. Um, if there were classes that you had to take because you needed to be able to connect to labs, things like that. So we ended up with about 40% of our student population on campus. I think, I hope I got that number right. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, it's a much smaller group than we're going to have in the spring. We anticipate having a much larger segment mm -hmm. of the student population here. And that choice was supported by the very thing you're talking about, that our first years didn't know us, didn't already have those connections. So we thought it was in, in, in especially important for them to be able to come to campus and be able to have that experience, even as we would then pivot into the spring to ha and have more of them at home and bring more of the returning camp students back to campus. So yes, I think that was part of it. But for our colleagues at larger institutions that already have established online um, programs and experience teaching online, mm -hmm. I think they may have had that as an advantage that they were working from that we didn't have. We just didn't have the background mm -hmm. with it. So I, I don't know how much I would trade one off with the other. I think that both of those were true. Well, if if I can, um, that's that's a great, that, Jill, those are great questions. And Michael, I'm really, really impressed with the depth of the answers. Um, I, I think this is, a part of it is that this is, this is a technology initiative, but it plugs into so many parts of the campus environment as well, higher education in general. We have a few questions that have just come in. 
Uh, and I, I wanted to share these uh, with you all because they're typically great questions. I'll flash them on the screen. Uh, so we have one from uh, Dean Raj out at uh, SUNY Old Westbury. What do the experts feel about privacy concerns and camera during class sessions? What's the impact of allowing students to turn their cameras off? Which one of you want? I have thoughts on that, but well, I'm really curious to hear Jill's thoughts on that too. I'm, I'm happy to give an initial answer from my own vantage point. In our conversations with faculty, we've encouraged them to um, be mindful that a student having their camera off may not just be because they're disconnected and because they are not engaging, right? Um, I tell you, I, when we first started using Zoom Wholesale, the virtual backgrounds was something that to me seemed like a nice add-on. I didn't quite understand why they made such a big deal out of it until my then four-year-old son walked naked through one of my meetings, right? And I became a convert to Zoom backgrounds after that, right? <laughs> um, and, and it became interesting for us to have conversations with our wider community because someone may have the background on because when they're on campus, it's really hard to tell the differences between my socioeconomic status and yours. Maybe what I'm wearing, maybe the brand names, that kind of thing. But if you get to see the background of the room that I'm connecting from or the fact that my younger sister is at the other side of the table, it can feel very different than I'm connecting to a colleague who is at their, you know, the family's second home. It just could feel very, very different. So it's requiring that for your students to turn it on as opposed to building an environment in which they're welcome to and they might want to, and maybe asking them to turn it on when they're going to ask a question or finding some way to give them agency have been the kind of conversations we've been having here. Uh, but I would love to hear your thoughts on this across the industry, Jill. Yeah. Sure. Um, so for uh, us listening to students, they really appreciate having the flexibility to turn their cameras on and off. Um, some of our students were here on the West Coast. They attend school on the East Coast. So them rolling out of bed for a nine o'clock class at 530 in the morning, they really appreciate not having to be on camera and they can be in their pajamas and listen in anyway. Um, so that's one issue. The other is um, security on testing. We've heard a lot of feedback from our students that they believe without much evidence, you know, these are students, they, that, um, that the testing has been harder and that there is more monitoring because of uh, concerns about security and cheating. And so in some ways, they're a little bit dismayed that they're not being trusted. Um, they, they also know their own experience too. They're, they're not, they're not uh, they don't mince words. They definitely readily confess to being able to use Google um, you know, as needed. They try, you know, not to do it on testing, but they really appreciate the flexibility during a class that they can just sort of look something up really quickly if they don't understand um, and the teacher's still moving on with the lecture. So those are a couple of issues. I think for us as a consultancy, then we work one-on-one -on -one with students. So when we're in their bedrooms and they don't mind sharing that with us, it really helps us to get to know them more. So I think for faculty, if students are willing to share that with them, you know, just even picking out something in the background, oh, what's that teddy bear behind you? Or what's that picture mean? It can start those, those connections that we don't get access to when they're just sitting in front of you in a lecture hall or would be harder to, to get to. So that might be a, a way for faculty or staff to start making some of those personal connections, which are necessary for any sort of learning um, and, and, and building that trust. But I think the other, the other issue is that students feel like if they're not cheating, they believe that their colleagues might be. Um, and so this is really affecting the grading um, where they feel like the curves are being affected by students taking advantage of the idea that they're at home and can cheat um, and there aren't as many um, I guess protocols in place or backs, backstops to really stymie that. But my question always is about cheating is why do students feel that pressure? Um, why do they feel the pressure to perform? Um, and, and how are we gonna address those issues more so than, well, we just need to stop it and tell them it's bad because that, that doesn't get to the heart of the problem. For some reason, those kids feel the need to have to compromise their own morals and their own integrity, which you know has larger consequences than than um, the idea of a disciplinary infraction. Well, those are great answers for a terrific question, Raj. And uh, Jill, afterwards, I can I can share a science fiction story that's just about um, remote proctoring. All right, about. perfect. Um, my students are fascinated by it. Uh, thank you. Uh, and again, if you're if you're new to the forum, uh, what we just did with Raj's question is typical. Um, so if you just want to type in a question, please uh, feel free. We already have a stack of these coming up, and. Uh, Including we have one from oh, Sally. I'm going to try and pronounce your last name. Please forgive me if it's if it's brutalized. 
Sally Mudiamu from uh, Portland State University uh, has a question about uh, what happens next. What will stay post COVID in relation to virtual collaboration? Great question, Sally. Jill, you want to go first this time? Sure. Um, I think in some ways, um, students are learning different resources. Um, they're learning different ways and having to advocate for themselves. Um, there's a lot of self-direction. I think college takes that step up anyway from high school. You know, I work with high school students and college students. So they always talk about that they have to be more self-directed in college. But distance learning has really uh, intensified that ability for them. So I think they're more resourceful. I think they take a lot more initiative and they're less, um, they're having to learn how to ask for help, which is you know just a skill that we all struggle with at times because it, it makes us a little bit vulnerable. But I think also having the backstop of being at home, they're a little more comfortable to, to do that. Um, and they find that professors are a little more willing to talk to them after hours or outside of office hours. So that, that's been um, a place that I think will stay is that kind of, um, more active learning and engagement in their own learning and the ownership of their own their own education more so than faculty or staff having to carry the carry some more water for them. That's a great answer. I really appreciate that. And, and I think the piece that comes to mind for me is an observation I'm watching play out among our faculty. Um, and whether it will stick or not, I think is an open question. Right? So I, 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 I won't venture to say for sure that I know this will, will hang around. But this is a, after 20 years of doing this type of work in higher ed, this has been the first time I have observed at scale that that the more technically um, adept and technically minded faculty who would have been doing a lot of these initiatives anyway, um, are now collaborating across disciplines with colleagues who have normally been much more hesitant. Right. Because what I'm used to having is this collection of really technically minded faculty who come up with all these great ideas of things they want to pursue and then everybody else. Right. And, and that there's. You always have to be careful not to build solutions that they ask for that doesn't necessarily work for everyone. Um, but now we're getting these really shared uh, conversations just, uh, just because so many opportunities have opened, even as we've faced challenges, that now that I can engage um, a guest speaker virtually for 20 minutes in a lecture, suddenly you know the world's my oyster. I can bring in from all over the place for these really short segments, um, as long as I consider time zones and the other pieces, right? But, that, that's just showing up in so many different disciplines. And one of the reasons I was excited to see that the some of the videos that our faculty were kind enough to record to show for their, their colleagues, here's how I'm using iPads in my my work and my with my classes and with my students. And we've had submissions from faculty in math to English to romance languages, but we never had those types of examples at that kind of level before. And I'm really intrigued to see how much of that will carry forward, whether it's around iPads or not, but just that I, I think we've demonstrated the really, really demonstrated the scale of what's possible in ways that we've only been able to talk about before. And I think just to if add a little bit to that from students, from the student perspective, they really appreciate when when teachers or professors are really open about what they're doing um, yeah. and that they're learning this as well. It sort of humbles and you know humanizes this whole process in a way that that um, it's no longer about well my professor doesn't know and they're an authority so I'm going to discount them. It, it actually builds the trust when a when a professor is open and and um, humble in that way to say well I'm I'm working on this too and what what's your feedback? It really engages students and and builds that trust even further. Yes, oh, well said. Um, I really sadly I appreciate that look ahead. And by the way. Uh, I was just speaking with another Portland State University uh, faculty member, your um, uh, Corsi, who is an uh, expert in indoor air quality, who will be very much in demand over the next few months. Uh, and thank you both, of course, for the great, great answers. Uh, we have a question uh, that popped up in the chat box, uh, and actually we have a series of questions, Michael, directed right at you. Um, and so, Jill, you're going to want to pounce, uh, as you can see these applying more generally. The first one is, can you give some insight? This is from Amanda Rossensweig. Um, who asks, can you give some insight about scaling this program for a college with 15,000 students? Is it practical or would it only be available for students in need? Uh, so short answer is yes, it's doable. Practical is a different question. But um, so let me start with, is it doable? When we began this conversation, well, I'll back up first. We had at least, we had identified an area of opportunity that had been announced as part of our um, 
capital campaign that actually that kicked off in January, um, right before COVID kicked in, right? So in January, we had announced capital campaign and part of it was a mobile computing program. But that one was intended, we had designed it to have MacBook Pros. That's what we were going for. Hmm. Because we, we realized that iPad would be really useful, but we had concerns, I had concerns, that we would have to spend years kind of re, uh, reconfiguring the background infrastructure to work well on iPads, because not everything is designed to work well in an iPad interface. Right. Um, and I had a lot of conversations with colleagues at Ohio State, because they launched uh, the largest iPad initiative in the country two years ago. This is Ohio State, right? So the, fir the first year class was 14,000 students, and they're doing it, right? And so to do it at that scale kind of means that anyone can actually pull it off if it's all about finances and logistics. And I'm not trying to minimize the amount of work that it takes to do. Um, but as we engage with them, it, it really helped us start to clarify, here are some of the opportunities. And so when COVID happened, we ended up switching from the MacBook direction to iPads. One, because we had more students who were going to be at home. Two, it would allow us to address the, the um, internet access question that I mentioned before in ways that we couldn't do as reliably with MacBooks, unless we sent out hotspots as well. And we had done some of it but there were shortages and it just got really, really complicated. And also we felt strongly that the Apple Pencil, Apple Pencil 2, if I have to be specific, would give us these um, all these opportunities that a standard laptop wouldn't be able to do. And we were getting that from feedback from one of our faculty-led groups, the, the Continuity of Teaching and Learning group that was convened in April to help us build the model for what would effective teaching look like in the fall. And it was recommendations from them, frankly, that helped us to step back and question, well, maybe we should morph the plans for the mobile computing program to focus on iPads to allow us to move in that direction. So that's that's the larger answer. I do think it's possible. It is expensive. And there's one of the things I love about what Ohio State's done is they're funding it by doing things like moving intentionally to open educational resources, right? So driving some of the savings from textbooks and publishing and all the all the things that are normally wrapped up in there, driving those savings into um, providing for the offsetting the costs for providing iPads to all of their students. So we knew that model existed, and I just don't know many institutions of that size that have been able to do it. Um, but can you do it? It's kind of hard to argue that it's not possible if Ohio State can pull it off at those numbers. Uh, Amanda, that's a great question. Oh, please, please go ahead. Really looking at learning process. Your uh, audio is being uh, garbled. Um, is your connection okay? Uh, it's still it's still pretty garbled. Um, can you just uh, reload just reload the page, the web page? Sure. I'll bring you back up. Um, we'll bring her right back uh, as as soon as that page uh, reloads. Um, but uh, I thank you, uh, Michael, for that incredibly rich answer. Uh, Amanda, very, very grateful for your, uh, for your question, taking us right to the point of, uh, of scale. Um, Jill, are you back? Uh, oh dear. No, no, you're, 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 you sound uh, robotic and your, uh, your video is uh, stuttering. Um, it may be that uh, uh, your bandwidth has dropped, or maybe that something else is competing with your uh, uh, okay. finger. Is it possible to pause for video and keep the audio? Uh, not really. It's 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 oh, okay. That's it's a curious. combination. Let me see if I can change my. In the meantime, I think we can keep going. Okay, uh, and if you'd like, uh, if you'd like, to, um, if you uh, you can type in the chat box, and uh, I can I can read stuff out. Sure. Uh, we had uh, uh, another question again aimed at uh, Bowden. We had a couple more. Uh, one from uh, Ray Garcelon. Let me just put this on the screen. Uh, and Ray asks, uh, "What did students who used iPads to complete and submit assignments, contribute, and, and collaborate online learning activities find more or less challenging or easier with mobile learning?" Yeah, I, I appreciate the question. I don't know if I have a specific answer from the student perspective as yet. I, I think that the because completing and completing and submitting assignments, many of our faculty keep in mind that we didn't have an extensive online learning um, platform before. That's not what we were really doing before. So the faculty are using Blackboard now much more than they ever have in the past. 
But my impression, and this is where this, the assessment is going to help us flesh a lot of this out, my impression so far is that a lot of the assignments are not necessarily being submitted through Blackboard. Um, and I think it, what I have seen, examples of faculty asking students to, you know, they might complete something and then upload it later on. So one of the challenges that I have seen is that the Blackboard, and I say this with all due respect to Blackboard, we are a Blackboard customer and have been for a long time. Uh, Blackboard wasn't really designed with a mobile computing in mind, especially on an iPad platform. So some of the things that you think would be straightforward are not quite as easy as I, as I believe they should be. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's one of the things that we are taking feedback on. You don't switch learning management systems in the middle of the academic year, so I'm not proposing one. Right. Um, but you know, just re realizing that picking a, a, a tool that the underlying infrastructure was not necessarily tied for, that's where we had some hesitation as we were designing the mobile computing program in the first place. And I think that's one of the places it's showing up. But assignments in, in Japanese or non-Roman uh, non character languages mm -hmm. are much easier to complete with a digital pen if I can write it out digitally and send it to you digitally, as opposed to having to write it and then scan it and then upload it, right? Which is all the steps that would normally be required if you're doing this remotely without having that interface. So those are the places that I'm seeing, but that's more from my observation. And I'm cautious to offer that as a definitive since we are still in the early stages and we're only beginning the assessment now. But I hope that helps to maybe answer to offer answers to the question. Understood. Uh, that makes sense. Um, and uh, thank you again, uh, Ray, for uh, the really great question. Jill, let's give you an audio test. How do you sound? Uh, is that better? Oh, that's it, perfect. Oh, all right. Wonderful. Oh, um, well, just to add to that question and, and also from the earlier is, is I think you really want to take a look at the learning process and that students aren't used to learning on technology. This is, you know, Gen Z obviously is the most digitalized generation we've had ever in humankind, but they use technology very differently. And I think the more that faculty can really understand how this generation accesses technology and how they think and, and navigate through that, then they'll be able to really keep transforming the pedagogy um, no matter what you do. So if you're gonna distribute 15,000 or 1,000 uh, you know, computers or iPads, then I, I think we really need to think about the learning process and transforming it uh, for this generation and teaching them literally how to learn using technology because that's been a big challenge for our students. They'll turn something in, but because of the security protocol, it goes blank. So now they have a zero or they, they don't know how to use the, the um, testing what interface, so then they don't answer all the questions. It, it's just creating a lot of additional challenges for them. Jill, I, if I can, I, I really, really res uh, appreciate you making that point because I, I have been really frustrated, and this goes back 10 years at least, at how sometimes, how dismissively we speak about our students' ability to use technology. And we assume that no matter how complicated the tech is that we put in place, that, oh, they're, they're super technical, so they'll figure it out when most of these systems are not designed by them or with them actually as the lead customer. They're designed for the institutions, right? And so we run into these situations where the, the, the user interface clearly was not built for, with them in mind. And you run into, and, and I, I keep running into these places where that shows up. And that's why we're trying to be super mindful of that as we begin the process. But I really appreciate that point. I'm curious, just you know, offhand to think about what the most uh, tablet-friendly LMS is or the most tablet friendly BLE. But that's not the question I want to ask. The question I want to ask is uh, another one that's from uh, one of our one of our uh, participants. And this is from David Holma at Harvard Business School. And David asks, uh, faculty, staff, students always want to use different tools or apps. How do you balance experimenting and being flexible with not supporting everything? Yeah, that's probably my favorite question right now. And I, again, I'm really curious to get Jill's thoughts on that. Right, because at, as a technology leader, as a CIO, the instinct is to make sure that whatever we do is supportable, right? And, and I think that that's a healthy instinct, uh, but it's an instinct I resist, uh, especially in the spring. The, 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 advantage, the stance we took was we want to enable the faculty and students to be successful. Um, and we would worry about consistency a little bit less as we went through the emergency version. But as we started to prepare for the fall, we were trying to flip that back and say, Let's center the user experience, let's center the student experience, let's center the faculty experience. So why should you have to learn four different video conferencing systems? Because you know two of your faculty members who are teaching two of your classes um, have just found this one particular tool that they prefer, and it's not the one that everybody else is using. So we've been, we've been trying to encourage more in that direction. 
we haven't drawn hard lines because this is so unique for us. And so I think we've had a lot of opportunity to learn. But we have said to the faculty, if you're going to pick something that's completely off script, um, we won't be able to support you in the way that you're used to of, you know, you call or email us and we'll solve everything that's going on for all of your students. And that just appreciate if you're going to go off on your own, you really will be on your own in some regards. And that might not work as well for you and for your students and trying to balance that a little bit at the same time appreciating. And so we're going through a conversation now as an example of faculty members in the languages are identifying that the visual layout for Teams and for Zoom, neither one of them was kind of built for the type of small group conversational work that they do mm -hmm. all the time. Mm -hmm. And so they've been looking for solutions that are more responsive to that kind of design. And the first one that they put, a couple of the faculty found was out of a company that just started in Russia. It was less than a year old. We did a security assessment and the security assessment didn't really go well. They, mm -hmm. they just found a new one that just came up that the company literally started in August. The tool looks phenomenal, but the company's two months old. And so there's this caution of, well, how, how do we experiment with that and create room for that? But just appreciate that, you know, we got We have to keep in mind that students now have to learn yet another tool and we, we have to find a way to support that as well. So it's, it's not a simple answer, unfortunately, but I think it's that that interplay between the two of them. And, and I'll add to this. I think that liberal arts institutions are in a unique position to be more experimental, in my, in my opinion from my own experiences at much larger larger institutions. Mm. When I had 24,000 students I was supporting, there's no way we could experiment at scale the way we can here because we have 1,800. Um, so there there are trade-offs that I think we're in a position to, to take advantage of, and we're trying to do more of that. It's one of the great affordances of small colleges that they can turn on a dime. Um, and, and really- We really can, but we normally don't want to. <laughs> right? I said can. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I think students appreciate when there's a standardization of, of the, the kinds of tools that are being used because then they can adjust. Um, you know, in this uncertainty, I think any places where they have a little ledge of, of some sort of stability is giving them, a, you know, a place and an anchor, anchor to hold on to. But what they also are appreciating from professors is a flexibility to account for that uncertainty and that life sort of keeps happening and they don't have as much control of the circumstances when they're at home um, a, as they do possibly when they're focusing and, and living on campus or living near campus. Um, so I, I think in some ways, having a standard tool is really useful for them rather than them feeling like it's inflexible. But I think also when students, um, what they've appreciated is when they bring up a new tool to a professor and it's brought up enough times that then they can utilize that to either turn in their work or engage um, but again, I think it still comes back to the human component. The breakout rooms in Zoom are wonderful and designed for that kind of small group chat. But if you don't know anybody in the classroom, then they're going to sit in awkward silence until they're called back into the larger lecture. And it, it's sort of a waste of time for everyone. So it's really about, you know, I, just to keep reiterating my point again, but it, that community, I think, is really important. And the, and the piece that students really are talking the most about, at least to me. Well, uh, that's again, that's a pedagogical issue too, um, uh, uh, for the instructor and students to work with. We have we have more questions coming in, friends, and uh, don't forget if you want to uh, press the video button, you can join us on the top. Uh, we have one a library question uh, that's coming to us from uh, Colorado. Let me bring this up. It's from Annie Epperson at Northern Colorado. She says, "Have there been any particular technological challenges as students and faculty have made use of library resources?" Such as e-reserves, various databases, or e-books to support classes or projects. I, I think, first this time. Yeah, go ahead. Go. Go ahead. Um, well, some of our students have just stopped using the library, honestly, because it's it's such a, a pain to be able to access resources, or they're not even near campus. Um, so I think that's been difficult. Also, students have told me that. Um, they used to go and check out textbooks or use the reserves at the library so they didn't have to purchase additional uh, materials that were required for the class. Mm -hmm. And so they've taken on the additional expenses this semester. Um, you know, and many of our students can afford it, but it, it, it has been an additional expense to not have the library. Um, I think in some ways, some students are really dismayed because their campuses are closed, so they can't access them to the same degree, but they're still paying the same fees. So. I, I know that this has been in the national media about the value, but students are really questioning that because there are just resources not available to them. Well said, well said. Michael, have you, have you had anything to add based on the Bowdoin experience? 
Yeah, the piece I would add is that our, our library colleagues have been um, the key partners for all of our planning around the online learning effort. In fact, I see a couple of them are on with us tonight, today um, so that they were helping us account for those issues early on. Um, and some of the examples I've seen is I'm partnering with faculty so that the resources can be made available through clicking through to them as opposed to having to clearly, since we only had first years on campus, checking it out from the library physically cannot be the only way they can get access to it. So making sure that we're thinking those pieces through at the outset. Um, and I'm seeing more and more faculty really planning for that. Since they know the classes are going to be online, you want to lower the barrier for students to get to that, get access to those resources. Um, but the librarians have clearly been key partners in, in all of this work for us to, to figure that out. We had a quick uh, question just popped up from Melanie Hogue at Southwestern University in Texas. And she asked, uh, one challenge in particular, uh, those where the provider specifies the students have to be on a campus network to sign up. Mm. Yeah, that was one of my most frustrating conversations as we went through this emergency pivot in the spring into the fall, that uh, in the spring, a, a number of companies really stepped up to the plate and acknowledged that this was emergency. Everybody was switching and going home. And so they started to loosen a lot of those restrictions in ways that I thought were really, really helpful. Um, but then a lot of them seemed to think that the emergency ended in the uh, in August, which I couldn't quite figure out that you know, suddenly they said, oh, you know, you should thank us for allowing you to have this access and that's going to change come September 1st in ways that were really frustrating. So some of that we had to navigate, but for the most part, I think we've been successful. Um, it's just been a moneymaker for a lot of companies and it's been really hard for them to extend the model they were used to. Melanie, thank you for, uh, for that. And Michael, good luck. That's, um, that's, that's always a, a real fear. Um, we have uh, another question that's coming to us from uh, Sherry uh, Restori. Uh, again, Sherry, I hope I didn't mispronounce it too horribly. Uh, just, Michael, can you share more about the space in which you collected those faculty stories? We just rolled out a thousand iPads to faculty and would love to hear more acquiring this broadly. That's from Coastal Carolina University. Sure, I will put a link in the chat and I will share it with Brian later so that we can send it out. There's a, there, this one is to a link of a collection of faculty. I think it's only eight videos, but it shares some of the good examples of how, what, how they're using it. And our, the college's communications department is now publishing um, stories of how examples of classes that are teaching online. So it's not just about the iPads, but how they're doing um, visual art or um, or Japanese or you know, all these different languages, excuse me, all these different classes um, as examples of how here's some of the work that's going on. Because keep in mind, Bowdoin's 220 plus years old. This is the first time we've ever taught on online classes, not even just at scale at all, right? It was in the spring and in the fall. So there's a lot of um, new learning for us as an institution. Um, and so those conversations about what we will retain as we move forward have been really interesting. Um, I'll make sure the other, I don't have the other link to the news articles, but I'll make sure we pass those on as well. Okay, there was a, there was a great one from a Japanese professor, which I was really impressed by, um, just working through a whole series of modalities. Um, I just one shared, of my favorite ones. Yeah, uh, I just shared this with the, uh, in the chat. I'm going to put this out on, on uh, Twitter in a second. Um, but we had a, a, another question that uh, came up, or rather an observation, um, and this was from uh, uh, Liz Evans. Uh, from uh, LACOL, uh, and she was really struck by uh, what you two said about collaboration uh, and how uh, faculty collaboration is something that you think will go way beyond uh, the pandemic era. And I, I was struck by that, and, and, and as was Liz. And I wanted to return to that because we're, we're coming close to the end of our session. I'm, I'm just wondering if we look ahead, say, five years, uh, thinking about what what you're learning, uh, Michael, from your faculty as well as from your students and staff about this, and and Jill, what you're seeing about these experiences with mobile technologies, uh, connected devices, where do you think they're they're taking us in the next say five years? It's a great question. I, if I could start, I think um, in some ways there's a fatigue at the moment um, that I think people are going to have to kind of work through. Um, but I think that they're also learning to be very creative about how they're staying in touch with each other and collaborating using technology. Um, you know, they were used to using things like Google Documents and, and sharing um, uh, ideas in that way. But I think people are, are having to learn other ways to, to reconnect um, in terms of using technology. Yeah, and I would definitely 
I definitely agree with that point about fatigue and burnout, right? That, that I've been really careful about having those conversations about what's going to stay and what's going to stick while we're still in the midst of, of so much, um, so many challenges that we're navigating. And even as things are going well, just being mindful that it's, it's really intense right now. Uh, that right. said, Liz is actually leading an organization called uh, LACAL. It's a liberal arts consortium for online, online learning. And my former institution was uh, really active with them. And, and actually Bowdoin is considering um, being a member because okay. I think that those types of cross institutional partnerships, uh, this is the type of experience that shows you why these are so powerful and how powerful they can be. We've benefited because of our location. We've had a long history of partnering with Colby and Bates colleges because they're both within half an hour for us, of us. So the three institutions have done a lot of work together as we planned for the fall, as we went through the spring experience. Um, and there's a lot of learning that we benefited from being able to share from three institution. But if you're able to expand that out to a larger group of peer institutions who are struggling with many of the same questions, mm -hmm. I think there's even more opportunities. And if anything, that this experience is teaching us that that location matters a lot less for some of these pieces than we have thought historically. I would um, encourage you as you're collaborating with other institutions and other faculty members is really to take into account the students that many of them choose college because it's a coming of age experience as much as it's an education. And so that is the part that they're most dismayed by. And I think that's going to have a lasting effect into the next five years that there's this whole generation and cohort of young people who are going to either delay that or it's just gonna, they're gonna come to age in a way that, that gener we haven't in many generations through college. And so their maturing process is fundamentally different. I'm not sure how that's exactly gonna play out in the workforce, but I think that there's some brewing resentment and frustration that they're not being able to access that kind of social activity and the networking and being more self-sufficient on their own. There's frustration that they're living in their childhood bedrooms and going to college at the same time. So. I, I think any I, any conversation about the pedagogy and the education is going to have to account for that because you're going to have you know high school students that are behind these guys who are in that same situation who are going to mature into college. That's what we're hearing from our seniors is they're having a really hard time imagining right now as they're applying to college what college is going to look like next year. They're so uncertain and very and very dismayed about the process. So for them to start envisioning the future is really difficult. We know from. Uh uh, data released last week from the National Student Clearinghouse that um, total enrollment in U.S. education went down about four points, but the first-year student enrollment dropped by something like 11 to 16, depending on, on which uh, which sector, which is really, really huge. Uh, I mean, even if we get some kind of magic vaccine and people all take it, big, big yes, right, in, in, in a half year, um, that gap is still going to be with us for, for years to come. Uh, both as institutions, but also those those individuals. And, and Brian, to that point, and maybe I'll frame this as a question, Jill. Your your point about seniors is the one that I'm really nervous about, right? Because first years this year had one semester in their senior year that was unusual, and then they went into the fall. Um, but the seniors now have had a year of their high school experience, and whether their high school experience, virtual high school experience, will be anything like what their virtual college experience is like. It's really hard for most of us to not project it into the future. And I could, I, I, I have a suspicion, and I'm just curious how you think about this, that the number of leaves and, leave, and um, gap years is just going to increase next year versus this year across the industry. But I'm curious how you're thinking about it. Well, I think that's definitely a, a conversation that more students are having every year. You know, more students talk about gap years, but I think that they are talking about that because they're just gonna see if they can wait this out. But I think um, the other part of that conversation is they're starting to acclimate to the idea that this is just going to sustain itself, that this pandemic is, you know, the vaccine and everything else, we're just going to sort of have to adjust. So they're looking at college a little bit differently um, and, and starting to think through. And, and this is just what we do, because in 20 years of our practice, we find that it's most practical is for kids to really think about who they are and return back to what's your core aptitude so that then they can define their life's purpose and then they match backwards into the university. They match the university to them rather than chasing a bunch of statistics or I need to get to this you know, most prestigious school or whatever it is, but you know, is bad and the right fit for me? This is what I know of myself. And I think if, what, if more students in high school and even in college currently take that time to do that self-reflection 
then they're going to really be able to take advantage of the resources that are being offered at Bowdoin and any other university going forward. And, and so their enrollment, it may drop, but it'll be a different kind of placement where kids are understanding why they're there, not just because since kindergarten the, in the academic meritocracy, they've expected to go. And I think that's gonna fundamentally shift uh, the work that you all do at the university level in higher education. We, I, I don't want to rush you, but we have time for one last question. And, and by the way, thank you both. Those are, those are great forward-looking answers. And Jill, I love the way that you're looking so closely at the student experience, psychologically and sociologically. Uh, this this takes us. This question takes us back inside the institution. This is from Doyle Frisbee, longtime uh, member of our community. And Doyle asks, "How well is the Central Technology Organization aligned with the Teaching and Learning Group to support funding requests supporting faculty and students? In other words, who makes the final decision?" So I guess that's a question for you um, about Bowdoin, um, uh, Michael, and then uh, Jill, if if you want to add anything from what you've seen in the institution. Sure. So here, I, this is one of the first times that I can say with confidence that we are joined at the hip, right? We made the decision around the iPad program as a partnership between IT and the academic affairs department, right? So it was, it was the, the Dean of Academic Affairs and myself when the idea first came up to modify the existing mobile computing program that we had developed in partnership with them. Um, and so it was, a, it was a joint conversation and, and the online learning and teaching program that we stood up to support all of the work was done in partnership between the two offices. Mm -hmm. So because I'm a senior officer, because I work at that level, we've been able to have those conversations and, and make those decisions together. Even the funding for everything we've done have been set up in such a way that um, I have the funds to support the, the faculty development and those pieces around it, but we do that in partnership with academic affairs. It's really wonderful to hear that cross collaboration between departments too. I think that that's really useful in a in a culture for students to really understand that that their university is is a united front, not competing interests between departments. Nicely said, very very carefully said, and um, and it's actually very nicely said because this is the end of our program. Uh, we've been going. Uh, great guns for an entire hour, and uh, I have to, with all regret, um, uh, put a pause in this. Um, thank you both, uh, Michael Cato, Jill Moore. This, this has been terrific. Um, I, Michael, my hat's off to Bowdoin for this great, great project. Uh, I hope uh, everybody can learn from this and, and apply it as they can. And Jill, I, again, I'm, I'm so, so impressed um, by your deep, deep commitment to the student experience through thank this you. Really difficult time. Um, so uh, well, just a quick question, how can we uh, best keep up with you both in, in your respective work? Michael, is, uh, is Twitter your, your best way right now? Uh, I, I have been teased that I'm on Twitter. I've been there a long time, but I don't say much. But yes, it's one of the places that, that you can find me. Um, and I'm trying to be better about sharing more of the work we're doing. Okay, well, we, we look forward to seeing you there. And uh, Jill, you're a, you're a Twitter fiend. Uh, I, I, I am. Right. Yeah, so Twitter is great, or our, our website, our blog, creativemarbles.com. And I'd love to hear um, individually from anyone as well. I'm happy to answer any individual questions beyond this this session. Great. And that's uh, MG uh, Cato uh, at, uh, at Twitter. And uh, that's also Jill Yashikawa uh, at, uh, at Twitter. Um, thank you both very, very much. We look forward to hearing as, as Bowdoin progresses and uh, as your work progresses too, Jill. Thank you. Uh, but don't you. go away, friends. Let me just point you to where things are going for the next uh, few weeks. Again, we have a whole series of topics ahead, ranging from technology to accreditation to work-life balance. Uh, we also have, uh, if you'd like to keep talking about this, a whole series of platforms for talking about it, everything from Twitter to Facebook and LinkedIn, as well as a Slack channel. Um, and if you'd like to go into the past, some people have asked about this, how do you access previous recordings? We have a huge suite of recordings going back, like I said, nearly five years. Just go to tinyurl.com slash FTF archive. Uh, it's about 230 recordings right now, all there for you. Uh, and if you want to um, learn more about us or about Shindig, of course, those are the two links. But in the meantime, thank you all for thinking with us about this really interesting project. Thank you all for your concerns about the integration of technology and learning. And above all, Take care of yourselves and stay safe during this extraordinary year. Looking forward to seeing you soon online next time. Bye-bye.